So this is the first video we're going to do on molecular solids or on molecules. Molecules are a really big part of this of this topic, so a very big part of the achievement standard. And what gets students confused often is the difference between intermolecular forces and intramolecular forces. And when you use which of those to explain the, the characteristic properties. So to start with, I'm going to go through the characteristic properties, then talk to you about the particles that they're made up of, and then the next video will be about the forces between those particles, those molecules, which will help you explain a lot of these properties. So what we find is that the molecular solids, the particles are made up of um, are molecules. So that means, for example, H2O, a molecule has two hydrogens and one oxygen. In the others, and the other things we've looked at in this topic, those are normally ratios. So it'd be two hydrogens for every one oxygen. But in the molecular solids, it's exactly that. Every particle is made up of, in H2O as an example, two hydrogens, one oxygen. And they exist as those discrete particles. So I've got H2O molecules floating around with forces in between them. Okay, so intermolecular forces. So they exist as H2O particles, right? So molecules. It's the forces between them, the intermolecular forces, that describe, that explain these characteristic properties. But it's worth knowing them. We find that they don't conduct heat very well. Okay, so the things like plastics and so on, they don't conduct heat, they melt instead because the energy breaks these intermolecular forces rather than actually being conducted, making them vibrate along and pass that heat along. They don't conduct electricity because they don't have charged particles. And we'll get to why they don't have charged particles in a moment. They have low melting po points and boiling points, and some of them even sublime. Things like dry ice and iodine don't turn into a liquid state. If you give them energy, they actually turn straight into the gas state without being liquids first. And they're often brittle. If you think of ice, if you think of dry ice, if you think of sulfur, if you think of sugar, they're actually quite brittle. They're relatively hard but brittle things. They're not as hard as the ionic solids and definitely not as hard as your covalent networks, but they're normally hard and brittle. Again, that's the, because of the forces between the particles. So what we're going to look at first are how they're actually made up. So the the bonding between the atoms that make these particles up. So in this case, I'm looking at these forces here, the ones between the atoms. So we call them intramolecular forces. Intra means inside. So for example, the internet is how the whole world can communicate electronically. But an intranet is just about, for example, your school or your business. And outside is made a password that should get into that. It's inside communication or inside sharing. Internet, you don't often need passwords for things, you can access anything. It's in between businesses, in between schools, uh, in between people that have nothing to do with each other sometimes. Okay. So we're looking at the forces inside, so between the atoms to make up a molecule. What we find is that in all of these they're always covalent, which means that they're sharing electrons. And this means that they're made up of non-metals. So you won't find these molecular compounds made up of metals that are made up of non-metals. So only a few of the elements are actually involved here. To understand about the bonding in here, we need to understand that there are two types of covalent bonds. We have the what are called pure or non-polar covalent bonds and the polar ones. In the polar ones, one side of the bond has got a very sorry, one nucleus has got a stronger pull on the electrons, so it creates a dipole, all right? We're going to first of all look at the pure ones, and they're not always, strictly speaking, pure, so we're going to use the word non-polar to describe these. This is where even if one atom does have a bigger pull than the other, it's not a much bigger pull, so they share the electrons pretty much evenly, so there's no dipole involved. The first one's quite obvious, two oxygen atoms are going to have the same pull because their nuclei are identical to charge. So the electronegativity of oxygen, I'm sorry, I have to check this, is 3.5. So the difference between the electronegativity and these, whether it's a single or a double bond, they'll be better. The difference in electronegativity will be zero. 3.5 minus 3.5 is zero. 
In this one, we've got carbon, which is 2.5, and we've got hydrogen, which has an electronegativity of 2.1. So the carbon is going to pull the electrons a little bit tighter than the hydrogen, but it's not enough to make a dipole. So the difference here is 2.5 minus 2.1, so 0 0.4. Our magic number is 0 0.5. If the electronegativity is smaller than 0.5, and in this case it's 0.4, then we say that it's a non-polar bond. This is important because it explains the property of the molecule. Once you've learned about shapes, and once you've learned about um, dipoles and so on, you'll be able to say whether a, a molecule is polar or not. And that'll be in the next video. Conversely, a covalent bond can be polar. So if the electronegativity is 0.5 up to around about 1.7, from about 1.5 things get a little bit grey, you have to have a look at the other properties. It could be ionic, it's a bit of what we call a continuum. It's above about 1.5 you need to look at other evidence to decide if it's an ionic bond or a covalent bond. Okay, but a, a safe bet is at 1.7, if it's non-metals and it's 1.7, it's, it's going to be a polar covalent bond. So if we look at the examples I've got here, oxygen is 3.5, hydrogen is 2.1. So 3.5 minus 2.1 is going to be 1.6. And so you're going to have a strong pull in this direction here, creating a dipole. So you get a slight negative side and a slight positive side here. Same thing is going to happen with carbon and oxygen. Okay, our carbon is 2.5, our oxygen is 3.5. So the oxygen is pulling the electrons in this bond a little bit stronger. So you get a slight negative side there and a slight positive side there. Right. So the intramolecular forces, just to summarise, are going to be covalent bonds. Your task is to use electronegativity to determine whether it's a non-polar covalent bond or a polar one. Stop there.